Greetings netizens of YouTube. You may have noticed that the UK election is the focus of my attention. To my mind it is crucial, not just in the British context where a clear choice is being offered, but in the global context in terms of the art of the possible. With that in mind, what the Labour Party are promising in their manifesto, with a brief reference to what the Conservatives are offering, deserves its own video. As the general election campaign enters full swing, policy should be a key factor when deciding which party to vote for. The 128-page Labour manifesto was released last week, although it had been widely leaked a few days earlier. For my sins, I've read it all, and will leave a link in the description bar. A living wage of £10 per hour. Banning of zero hours contracts. To reintroduce a 50% rate of income tax, this time for those that earn more than £123,000 a year, and increase income tax from 40 to 45% on those that earn more than £80,000 per year. An increase in corporation tax. An additional fat cat tax on companies that pay the highest earners. The repeal of cuts for the disabled. 100,000 new council homes or housing association homes to be created per year. Rent controls. Thousands of additional homes provided for the homeless. Invest over 30 billion over the next parliament in the NHS and in mental health services. Counselling service for kids in schools. The return of free school dinners. A national investment bank. Extending paternity and maternity childcare support. The renewal of Trident, the UK's missile defence system. That last policy, by the way, is controversial for Labour as Jeremy Corbyn and those on the left did not support the renewal of Trident. Banning fracking. Three billion more for education. Extending the Abortion Act to Northern Ireland. Yep, imagine this act didn't apply until now. Guaranteeing the triple lock on pensions. From my perspective, it's resoundingly positive. Frankly, I'd have to pinch myself and do a little dance if these policies ever come to pass. And I suspect that a lot of cynics of the current system would feel the same way. Even if the media would spend most of their time lambasting the new Labour government. There is barely a policy in this manifesto that I disagree with, but I'll try anyway. Perhaps I'd not commit to renationalise the water system in this manifesto, since three renationalisations is quite enough of an undertaking for any government. I haven't studied statistics in enough detail, but I'm not convinced that guaranteeing the so-called triple lock for pensioners is the best way. It's not that I have anything against it, I just believe that this money could be better spent protecting other vulnerable groups, perhaps in reversing some of the benefit cuts for the disabled, or to unequivocally commit to ending the benefits freeze. But I understand that this is a crucial day for demographic, and it's important to appeal to pensioners since the Conservatives won't provide this triple lock guarantee. I also wouldn't commit to abolishing university tuition fees in one term, although I support the policy. For me, it would be preferable to siphon away some funds to provide apprenticeships and training in practical skills for those that don't go to university. In my opinion, this demographic has been neglected, and these are some of the very same people who are in the process of turning away from Labour, feeling as if it's a party that represents some kind of southern, middle-class intelligentsia rather than ordinary people. Of course, I think this narrative of champagne socialism is mistaken, but it's a narrative that the media are pushing hard, and the likes of the Labour government under Tony Blair didn't do anything to dispel that sense. But let's focus on the positives. Living wage of £10 per hour. One of the main arguments against immigration is that foreign workers undercut wages. If the minimum wage increases, the incentive for employers to look for cheap labour that immigration can provide is removed. The argument that migrants undercut wages can be resolved this way. Of course, the arguments against a living wage are the same as those against a minimum wage. At what point do employers decide to stop hiring and unemployment starts to increase? Well, many right-leaning economists opposed the introduction of a minimum wage, and after it was proven that there was no significant impact, the majority of economists now support it, as do all of the political parties. The small print is that this policy is to be set in place by 2020. 
by then, I'm confident that there would be no negative impact on the economy to speak of. On the contrary, people will spend more, leading to an increase in employment. The introduction of 100,000 homes to be created per year is crucial, as are rent controls, particularly for those living in town centres who are being pushed out by gentrification. Any policies to home those living rough is hugely positive for me. The NHS and social care desperately needs investment. Everybody knows this. The tax rises. Yes, yes and yes. These are not radical tax rises. They still leave the UK well below the average of most developed nations. The argument that somehow the best workers and companies will up sticks and leave the country is nonsensical. In London we've seen a drastic increase in the number of the foreign rich. But have we seen this reflected in terms of a drastic increase of economic growth? The tiny minority of those that leave will not be missed. The real worry for businesses in financial services is the impact Brexit will have. The National Investment Bank is an idea that many economic analysts and small business owners have been pushing for for a long time. It's a great idea that small businesses would be able to borrow at moderate rates of interest rather than have to rely on high street banks or other hucksters. To give an example of an investment project that would also qualify for a loan, most know that withdrawal from the EU means that UK universities won't receive funding for science projects. Universities could receive funds from the UK Investment Bank to plug this gap. Renationalising natural monopolies Yes, if anything, there is an even stronger argument to do this now, now that those services have been exposed to market forces. The government can improve services and reduce the ridiculous price rises that the monopolists know we have no choice but to accept. In return, the government gets to pocket the profits those companies were making, which can be used for investment in our public services. There is another positive that may have come out of this. This manifesto, which was leaked a few days early, might have put pressure on the Conservatives to make some last-minute changes of their own, to rein back some of their radical cuts. But now that the Conservative manifesto is out, we can see how unattractive another five years of Tory rule would be. Some of the policies the Conservatives promised included leaving the single European market, cutting immigration, worker representation on company boards – yep, you heard that correctly – 4 billion into schools and cancellation of free school dinners, a vote on overturning the ban on fox hunting and finally an increase of 8 billion into the NHS over the next five years and a commitment to keep VAT frozen at its current level. You can see how those last two promises might have been added in an attempt to neutralise the popularity of the Labour manifesto following the leak. So, if we are stuck with the Conservative government, at least something vaguely decent was squeezed out of the Tories. Of course, the Conservative manifesto is entirely uncosted. And the there's costings a document that sets out the costs and whether this is all going to work, is that coming later or...? Did well, I miss it, or is it in, uh, online somewhere? No, you haven't missed it. Um, some of these <laughs> things, of course, will depend on uh, the level, for example, we will consult on the level of the means test. Essentially meaning its promises are targets rather than promises. On Sorry, it is a policy to get immigration down to tens of thousands, isn't it, or is it not? It's our ambition to get it down to Is it a tens policy to get immigration? I'm so sorry, is it not a policy to get it's, immigration down? It's an down? ambition, and we've had it in previous manifestos. Oh, hang on. What's the difference between an ambition and a policy? I mean, you've had it in previous manifestos, and you've palpably not delivered it. And following criticism, the Conservatives have done an extraordinary U turn, abandoning their so called dementia tax. The Labour manifesto was roundly slated by much of the media, with the Daily Mail and Telegraph working the same headline. The attempt to discredit Labour policies alluded to the 1970s, or made reference to Labour's 1983 manifesto dubbed the longest suicide note in history, supposedly because of its far left or communist agenda. At this point, I thought it would be apt to take a look at the main policies outlined in Labour's 1983 manifesto to compare with their current manifesto promises. Wikipedia states, 
The New Hope for Britain was a 39-page booklet which called for unilateral nuclear disarmament, higher personal taxation for the rich, withdrawal from the European Economic Community, abolition of the House of Lords and the renationalisation of recently privatised industries like British Telecom, British Aerospace and the British Shipbuilders Corporation. As I've already mentioned, Labour doesn't support unilateral nuclear disarmament. It does favour higher personal taxation for the rich. It only reluctantly favours withdrawal from the European Union because of the referendum result. It favours reform of the House of Lords, not abolition. It does not support the renationalisation of any of the mentioned privatised industries. Frankly, I'm not sure that there is anything left of the British Shipbuilders Corporation since that industry was decimated by Thatcher's policies. In fact, in the current political climate, withdrawal from the EU and abolition of the House of Lords are closer to Conservative voters' sensibilities. The 1983 manifesto also called for such extreme policies like a national minimum wage, devolution for Scotland, anti-pollution policies, and for fox hunting to be declared illegal. Other, just crazy ideas included measures to prevent monopoly in the media, upholding human rights and not supporting military intervention contrary to the UN Charter, supporting the rights of Palestinians to have self-determination and their own state, eliminating lead in petrol, etc. Despite the media continuing its anti-Labour stance, it's almost unanimous among analysts that voters were distinctly unimpressed with the Conservative manifesto and favour many of Labour's proposals. The latest opinion polls show that Labour has narrowed the Conservative lead to 9 percentage points. You will know by now what I think of that. I may have one more election video before the big day. It will be a return to my media propaganda series. Links to my other videos in the low bar. The focus will be on how the media covered this election. My question being, was this the most biased and unfair media general election coverage in British history?